This is the longest message and probably the most difficult message. It has the longest outline with more than eight pages. But during the live training, it was actually the shortest because the brother almost did not share much, just read through the outline. Anyway, this is a wonderful message. It is concerning the vision of the holy building of God in its outstanding features. You know, the book of Ezekiel has four sections. First section is on the glory. Second section is on the judgment. The third section is on recovery. And the fourth section is on the building. So starting from this message, we come to the section on the building. And we have to realize all the first three are for this building. The glory is for the building. The judgment is for the building. The recovery is also for the building. Now we can see this in the book of Ezekiel. We can also see this in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is parallel to the book of Ezekiel. You know, in the book of Revelation, there are four visions that John saw. The first one is the vision of the local churches. The second vision is the vision of the destiny of the world. And the third vision is the vision of the Babylon. And the last vision is the vision of the new Jerusalem. Everything is for the new Jerusalem. In fact, not just Ezekiel and not just Revelation. The whole Bible speaks about the building. If we look at the Old Testament, actually the whole Old Testament is basically about the tabernacle and the temple. Even before the tabernacle was built, Abraham, has a, he was a person that is living in the tents. So the tent eventually became the tabernacle and eventually it became the temple. So Solomon built the temple and the temple was destroyed but later on, when they returned from captivity, the temple was rebuilt by the captives who returned from the captivity. And later on, this temple was replaced by the temple at Herod's time. And it was mentioned in the New Testament that it was built for 46 years. But we have to realize, at the time when the captives returned from Babylon and they rebuilt the temple, and at Herod's time when the temple was rebuilt, it was never a full recovery of the temple that Solomon built. However, when we come to the book of Ezekiel, the vision that Ezekiel saw, it was more than a full recovery. It was more than a full recovery. If you look at the, the figure, the, 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 what is this? The, the, yeah, the plot plan of the temple, you would realize it is more complicated than the tabernacle and the temple. In fact, I will say, it is very, very complicated. I heard a brother said, it's best not just to look at the figure and try to analyze. The best is to draw the figure yourself. You look at the verses and you draw it, then you will find out how difficult it is. In fact, the brothers were just saying, there's actually a little error in this figure. Now it's for you to find out where is it. <laughs> okay. But the point is, actually, this was the vision that Ezekiel saw. But when was, when? It was not yet fulfilled. Now when will this be fulfilled? It will actually only be fulfilled at the time of the restoration. So this vision of Ezekiel concerning the building has first a literal fulfillment which is at the time of the restoration, during the millennial kingdom. But it also has a spiritual application. And all of this, all the details, all the outstanding features that are mentioned in this temple is for our experience today. So we are not here for the literal fulfillment. We are not Israelites. But we are here for the spiritual application. In fact, what we are building today is the real temple. The Old Testament, I mentioned, it was centered on the tabernacle and the temple. But do you know that in the New Testament, when the Lord Jesus came, He said what? The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He is the tabernacle of God. 
Then in John chapter 2, John chapter 2, he said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will build it up. And that temple, he was referring to his body. So who is the real temple? The Lord Jesus is the real temple. But eventually, when we come to the book of Ephesians, he says we are being built into the dwelling place of God in spirit. We are becoming the holy temple of God. So what is this temple? This temple is the church. Then eventually at the end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, John saw the new Jerusalem. He saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And when it came down, it says what? Behold, the tabernacle of God. And then at the same time, it also says, I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, are its temple. So the new Jerusalem is the tabernacle and is the temple. And this is the real fulfillment of the building. Yeah. And this is what we are after today. Yeah. Okay. Now I mentioned at the time when Ezekiel saw this vision, it was more than what Solomon had built. So there's a crucial point here. Actually, from Abraham's tent to the tabernacle, to the temple that Solomon built, eventually to the vision of the temple that Ezekiel saw, you see an enlargement. Everything, there's an enlargement. There's only one thing that is no enlargement, and that is the ark. You know who is the ark? The ark is Christ. So it shows us that Christ cannot be enlarged. But our experience of Christ and all His riches should increase. Is our experience of Christ increasing year after year, month after month, day after day? This is the second time we have this training. If you were here last year, it was wonderful last year. But this year should be better. Every year, our experience of the Lord should be better. Because our experience of the Lord should increase. Christ is enlarged. Christ does not enlarge. But our experience of Christ should enlarge. Okay, now that is Roman numeral one. Okay, let's just look at letter D. <laughs> let's read this together. Yeah, letter uh, letter D letter D thus beginning with Abraham's tent progressing to the tabernacle and then to Solomon's temple and concluding with a temple in Ezekiel's vision there is a continual progression in the enlargement of God's building in the Old Testament this enlargement signifies a continual increase in the experience of Christ by God's people. Okay, now, this is a vision. A vision on God's building. And actually, the building is the desire of God's heart. But you know, today, most people do not see this. We are really blessed. We are blessed that we have seen this vision. But we have to consider, how do we see this vision? There are two things that is needed so that we can see this vision. The first one is the time. The second one is the place. You know, when Ezekiel saw this vision, it mentioned it was on the 25th year of the captivity. In Ezekiel chapter 1, when he saw the vision of the appearing of the glory of God, it was on the 5th year of the captivity. And at that time, he was 30 years old. So in chapter 40, the 25th year of the captivity, it was 20 years after. What is this? It means at that time, he is 50 years old. Now what is the number 30 and 50? 30 is the year when a priest begins to serve. And 50 is the year when the priest starts retires. So this implies what? If you want to see the vision, you need 
maturity in life. I'm really not sure if we have really seen this. We have heard this. If you are in the church, you should have heard this building again and again. But have you really seen it? I was considering, you know, Brother Lee in the book, Experience of Life, he talks about knowing the body. And when he talked about knowing the body, it was already in the fourth stage. Not in the first stage, not in the second stage, not in the third stage, but in the fourth stage. It shows there is a lot of dealings that have gone on in our lives. There is a lot of growth in our lives before we can see this matter of the building. So do not worry that if you have not seen this completely. Let us pray to the Lord that we will grow in life. We just need to let the Lord grow in us, continually grow, that may our growth be proportioned to our years in the church life. Then eventually we will come to this stage. We will say, we have seen this matter of the building. I always rem remind it of what our brother would always say, do not assume that you have seen it. You know, the worst thing is you have not really seen it, but you thought you have seen it. We have to pray to the Lord. Lord, cause me to grow in life. And then it says that when Ezekiel saw this, it was on the beginning of the year. This shows that to see the matter of the building will give us a new beginning in our Christian life. Because by the time you enter into a new level, you enter into a new realm, you are totally different from what you were before. It is just like our salvation. Before you are saved, and after you are saved, there is a tremendous difference. Before you are consecrated, after you are consecrated, there is a tremendous difference. Likewise, if you have seen this matter of the building, and compared to before seeing, there is a big difference. You can no longer be independent. You don't just need the Lord, you need the body. And you don't need them because you feel you are really in need. You have this realization that without the Lord, you cannot live. And without the body, you also cannot live. So may the Lord really bring us to this stage where we will really see this vision of the building. How do we need, how do we see it? Just grow in a normal way. The second thing is the place. What is the place to see the vision? It is in the holy land. It is not in captivity. Ezekiel did not see this in the land of captivity. Jehovah brought him to the land before he saw this vision. So which means today, if we want to see the vision of the building, where, was, where must we be? We must be in the church. I know many here are church kids. Are you happy that you are church kids? You have to be happy that you are in the church life. This is the best place to see the vision of the building. You know, to see something, you need the right position. You need the right what? Standing. And you also need the right angle. This is actually my fourth time. You know, my coming this time to coaching is my fourth time to pass by Kuala Lumpur. The first time was on my way to Cambodia. I passed by Kuala Lumpur Airport. Second time, came coming back from Kuala, uh, Cambodia, passed by again the airport. Well, the third time, I was in Camp Kuala Lumpur, but from the, ho from the airport, we went straight to the meeting hall and then hotel. That's the only place we went. So, and this is the fourth time. So I've been here several times. I've not yet seen Petronas Twin Tower. I was trying to look at it from the airport. Where is Petronas? Cannot see it. I asked the brothers. It takes about an hour drive from the airport to see Petronas. So if you ask me, have I been to Kuala Lumpur? Yes. Do I have pictures with the Petronas Twin Tower? No. <laughs> How come no? Because I'm not in the right position. If I want to see the Petronas, where should I go? 
not just in the airport, I have to go to the city. And then, if the tower is here, and then I look at here, will I see the tower? No, I need to what? Turn. In Revelation, the same thing. John heard, right? The voice. And then what did he do? He turned. And when he turned, what did he see? He saw the seven golden lampstands. And he saw the Son of Man walking in the midst of the lampstands. So brothers and sisters, if we want to see, we need to be in the right position. What is the right position? The right position is in the church. Do not get away from the church. We are in the best, best, best place so that we can see this matter of the building. And then, Ezekiel was also brought to the high mountain. So where is the mountain? From the hotel room, we can see a mountain here in Kuching. Do we have to go to the mountain to see the vision? Where is the mountain today? In John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman told the Lord, our father said, you have to worship in this mountain. And you said, you Jews said, you have to worship in this mountain. But the Lord said, neither in this mountain, nor in that mountain. An hour is coming, and it is now. The true worshipers worship God in spirit. Amen. So you want to be in the mountain? Just turn to your spirit. Amen. When we are in our spirit, what do we see? We see the vision. So may the Lord... Keep us in the church life. Amen. And keep us what? Keep us in our spirit. Amen. Then grow in a normal way. Then eventually we will see this vision. Amen. And then, when we are in the spirit, when we are in the right place, what do we see? The first thing we see is not the building. The first thing that we see is a man. And this man... It's different from the man in Ezekiel chapter 1. The man in Ezekiel chapter 1 is a man that is on the throne. And that one has the appearance like that of an electrum. But this man in Ezekiel 40 is a bronze man. And he has a measure. Right? He is not in heavens. He is now on earth. Many Christians wanted to go to heaven. God wants to come to earth. He is not building His building in the heavens. He is building His habitation here on earth. And we cannot see it by ourselves. We need this man. Actually, if you read Ezekiel, you will find out how did Ezekiel saw the vision. How did he see the vision? It was this man who led him every way. That's why it's hard for us to figure out. If there's only a tour guide that will lead us every step, then we will see it clearly. Thank the Lord, we have the Son of Man. But He's there to measure. Okay, we will have another message on the man. We'll have another mes message on the measure. Okay, but thank the Lord for the man to lead us to see the vision. Then what should be our attitude? Okay, let's look at Roman numeral 5. Can we read that together? So today, God wants to show us this vision. But how do we see it? Number one, He says what? Look with your eyes. Number two, hear with your ears. Isn't it in Revelation, the Lord said, He was an ear. Let Him hear. May we what? Have an eye to see and an ear to hear. But not only hearing and seeing. Eventually, what we need? is to set our heart. We have to set our heart. Oh, I know, many times, young people, young people in the meeting, you look at them, they are looking at you. And it seems they are hearing you. But after the meeting, you ask them, it's blank. 
Because their heart is not there. Is your heart here this morning? We have to what? See with our, look with our eyes, hear with our ear, and then set our heart. Oh, set our heart on all that the Lord will show us. If you will not set your heart, you will miss it. Before you notice, you already miss a big part. And it will be hard to catch up. So may we set our heart. But that's not all. Eventually, he says what? That you may, what? Tell all. Tell all that you see to the house of Israel. So what we hear, what we see, what we set our heart on, after seeing this vision, what should we do? We should prophesy. This brings us back to prophesying. In the recovery, it's prophesying. In the building, what is it all about? It's still prophesying. Now, do not think. People do not understand this. Brother Lee always said, it's not people who do not understand. It's you who do not know how to speak. So if you don't understand, it's not your problem. It's my problem. <laughs> but brothers and sisters, let us look with our eyes. Amen. Hear with our ear. Amen. And then set our heart. Amen. And then go and tell all. Amen. Now let's come to Roman numeral 6. We begin with the outstanding features. Actually, every aspect of this building is Christ. You know, in God's building, it's just Christ. The Old Testament mentioned, actually the Bible mentioned, Christ is the foundation stone. Christ is the cornerstone. Christ is the top stone. Which means He is everything in God's building. So even the first thing that is mentioned here is the wall. Now what is the function of the wall? Let's read Roman numeral 6. The wall... So the wall is obviously what? A separation. You know, we have a veil here. This is like a wall. But can we cross over it? It's easy. Because it's only what? Curtain. But the wall in the temple, the height and the thickness are the same. I don't know what kind of wall is that. I've never seen a wall like that where the height and then the thickness is the same. If the wall is small, you can easily break through it. But this wall is so thick, it will take a hard time to break through it. So if you look at the wall in the cross section, the height is six cubits, the thickness is six cubits. So when you look at it and the cross section, what do you see? You see a square. And what is that wall? That wall is for separation. What is that wall? That wall is Christ. So this shows Christ is what? A square. This shows that He is perfect. He is upright. He is complete. And because of what He is, you know what? It separates what belongs to God and what cannot belong to Him. If you read the four Gospels, you will see how upright and how perfect the Lord is. You look at when he was 12 years old, when he was there, the first time went to the temple. I cannot imagine the parents live without him. Maybe all the all this childhood, he was such a good boy. If he was a naughty boy, the parents' eyes would always be looking at him. And they found out he's not with them only after three days. And then when they went back, they found him. He was obedient. So when you compare ourselves with him, I tell you, the more you read about him, how perfect he is, the more we see we are imperfect. Yesterday, brother, uh, Yon said he's a very punctual person. 
You like punctual person? If you are with a punctual person and you are not punctual, it will manifest you are late. If everyone is late, nobody will notice. But if there is only one that is always punctual, you will always be manifested that you are late. So when we come to the Lord, I tell you, we just get condemned. If you see what the Lord is, how perfect He is, how fine He is, how meek He is, how compassionate He is, then we realize we are not. And you try to imitate Him, we cannot imitate Him. Then He as the wall separates us. But thank the Lord, He's not just the wall. He is the gate. We do not need to climb over the wall. Actually, in John chapter 10, it says, the one who climbs over the wall are the thief and the robbers. Now, there's a gate. In fact, there are six gates here. And who is that gate? The Lord said in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved. So we do not need to climb over the wall. We do not need to imitate Him. We do not need to follow Him outwardly. We can pass through Him as the gate. John chapter 14, verse 6, the Lord said, I'm the way and the reality and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way today. Nothing can save us. Chanting will not save us. Doing good will not save us. Regretting will not save us. Only Jesus can save us. Because He is, he is the way. He is the door for us to enter. He passed through death. He entered into resurrection. And He said, in that day, in John 14, 20, the day of His resurrection, He said, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me. Amen. The Lord is in the Father. We are in the Lord. So where are we today? We are in the Father. So brothers and sisters, are you in or out? If He is the wall, we are out. But He is not just the wall. He is the gate. So today we are in. Now, this gate is complicated. Actually, there's, a, there's another figure. I think the brothers will give it to you this afternoon. It's not printed. Don't look at this. The gate has four sections. It has an outer threshold. It has a passage. It has an inner threshold. And it has a porch. Anyway, we don't have time to describe everything. I'll just mention two more points. The first thing is that there are three guard rooms on each side. Three guard rooms. So three guard rooms on each side, it means there are what? Total of six guard rooms. What is three? Three is the triune God. What is six? Six is man. But the three has been what? Split into two. This shows that Christ has been split on the cross. So that today, we can have an entrance into the temple. It is through the triune God coming to be a man, dying on the cross, opening the new and living way for us. And then this, the width of the gate is 10 cubits. The opening is 10 cubits. And this shows about the 10 commandments. This shows the Lord has fulfilled all the requirements of the 10 commandments. Brothers and sisters, we did not sneak in. We are not gate crushers. We enter legitimately. Sometimes if you go to a party, but you are not invited, you'll be afraid to see somebody to recognize you. Why are you here? But we are entrance. is legitimate. It has fully satisfied the requirement of God. Even Satan will have nothing to say. So today we are inside now. 
But once you get in, there's a pavement. What is that pavement? The pavement is made of stone. We are made of dust. If we stay on the ground, our feet becomes dirty. But thank the Lord for the stone. If you walk on the stone, it protects your feet from becoming dirt with the dust of the ground. So this shows there are two kinds of Christians today. One kind, a brother illustrated, going to work, after coming from work, home from work, watch television, and then on Sunday, do not go to the meeting, but go shopping. Are they Christians? Are they saved? But they are worldly Christians. But there's another kind. Who? After coming home from work, or maybe coming from school, what do you do? You go to the meetings. You call on the Lord. Then on Sunday, actually, Brother Lee said, Sunday is Lord's Day. It's not Sunday. Because too many, Sunday is what? Shopping day. Sunday is what? Sinful day. But for us, it is the Lord's day. We are not walking on the ground. We are walking on the pavement of stone. Praise the Lord. Our brother will continue. All right, let's all stand up and call on the Lord. Oh, Lord. Let's all say hallelujah. 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 Okay, you can be seated. Do not get sleepy yet. Just a little bit more. Don't get hungry yet. Just a little bit more. So, brothers and sisters, Brother Ron shared with us that this is one of the main burdens for the training is that we would see the dwelling place God desires to have on earth we would see the dwelling place and this outline is a major contribution to that burden you may think it's very long it's quite long but it's so good it describes the building to us. And we know from Ezekiel 43.10, write this verse down, Ezekiel 43.10, that we are to describe the house to the house of Israel, that they may feel humiliated because of their iniquities. What does that mean? That means that we should look at the house and draw spiritual significance for our Christian life. It's what God wants us to do. He wants us to look at the description and draw spiritual significance. So, during your study time, Read all of this wonderful outline. Amen. Read it and enjoy it. Amen. But right now, during this message, I want to describe a few outstanding features to you. Amen. Let's turn back to the title of this outline and let's read it together. Ready? Go. Circle outstanding features. Outstanding features. When you walk out of this meeting hall today, I want you to have some of the outstanding features in your pocket. Maybe you would really enjoy, oh, the gates. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the gates. Or maybe you would enjoy the wall. Praise the Lord for the wall. 
When you leave today, I want you to have some of the outstanding features. So in this time, what I'll do is I'll spend time on the gates and the holy chambers. There's another point in the outline that will be left for you in your study. But during this time, what I'm going to focus on is the gates and the holy chambers. Brothers and sisters, I have good news for you. There are gates in God's building. Praise the Lord for the gates. Brothers, there are gates in God's building. Do you know what this means? It means we can enter. It means God wants man to enter. Turn back to the previous point, point seven. Roman numeral seven, point A. Roman numeral seven, point A. I want you to take your pen, take your pen and underline the gate brings people into God and into God's building. The gate brings people into God and into God's building. Brothers and sisters, the gates mean God loves man. Are you happy God loves man? God desires for man to enter his building. There are gates on God's building. God loves man. He desires for man to enter into his building. I want to tell you a story about five college students who touched the Lord's heart for man. They touched the significance of the gates and their prayer changed the world. Five college students. In 1806, it's about 200 years ago, in 1806, in the northeastern part of the United States, there were five college students who did something radical. They did something amazing. They started to pray. How about that? Five college students started to pray. Pray for what? They started to pray, Lord, how about taking your gospel to China and India? They began to pray. And as they began to pray, brothers and sisters, God began to move. As they began their prayer in 1806, at the very same time, there was a young man in England with a burden for the gospel to China. His name was Robert Morrison. I want you to catch the vision. Five college students praying for the Lord to take the gospel to China and to India. And as they prayed, God began to move. And he thrust out Robert Morrison, who took the gospel to China. And brothers and sisters, he did it all alone. This young brother, he was in his 20s, about your age. He said, Lord, if you will send me, I will go. It was illegal for him to come. And it was illegal for him to preach the gospel. It was actually illegal for anyone to teach him Chinese. That's a pretty difficult situation. And throughout the entirety of his service in China, he gained one fruit. One fruit. 
he baptized one person. His translator, the person who taught him Chinese, this was his fruit. But what Brother Morrison did, in addition to gaining one fruit, was he translated the Bible into Chinese. How about that? He translated God's Word into Chinese. And about at the time of his death, the Lord raised up another brother. Remember the five college students. They're back in the United States. They're continuing to pray. Some of them are leaving and going to serve in China and in India to bring the gospel. And they're praying. And at the time of Robert Morrison's death, God moved again. And he raised up Brother Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a young man who took the gospel to inland China, further inland than the coast. At that time, the gospel had been preached mostly on the coast in China. And Hudson Taylor said, God, send me to the interior of China. And he took off, he took off his clothes, his western garb. He put it aside. He said, I want to wear what they wear. I want to speak how they speak. I want to learn their culture so that I can bring God to man and bring man to God. Our brother served in inland China. And near the time of his death, God moved again. There were seven college students in Cambridge, England. They became known as the Cambridge Seven. One of them was a very famous athlete. He played cricket, a very famous athlete named C.T. Studd. And six of his friends, one was a soldier, another one was a priest. They were all very wealthy. Their families had a lot of money. And they got touched by the Lord and said, Lord, we like to follow you wherever the lamb may go. So we, we put aside our career. We put aside, we, we put aside our wealth. We want to follow you to inland China. And as the Cambridge Seven were going, they were going around and speaking to all the, the universities in England. And the whole country got turned upside down. People would come, thousands of people would come to hear, why would you give up? Why would you give up your career? Why, why would you give up your position? What are you doing? Why would you follow the Lord to the ends of the earth? Even the Queen of England came to listen to their testimony. As they went to inland China, there was a move of God on the United States campuses known as the Student Volunteer Movement. They would travel around to the different universities in the United States and they would speak about taking the gospel to China, to India, to other places in Asia. And students would volunteer. Me, I'll go. I want to go. I'll leave my engineering degree here in the United States. I want to take the Lord's gospel to Asia. 
and hundreds of college students, they left and they went. And they established hospitals and universities and schools. And in one of those schools that they established, Trinity College in China, there was a young man who at the age of 17 gave his life to the Lord. And that young man's name was Watchman Nee. Brothers and sisters, all of God's move throughout that 100 years began with five college students who prayed. Five college students who touched the Lord's heart for man. They saw the significance of the gates. God loves man. God loves man. God desires all men to be saved. So they began to pray. And I believe in large part today, we're here because of their prayer. Five college students. Now, I have a question for you. What would happen, what would happen in the next 100 years if there were five college students in India who began to pray? Think about it. What would happen? Maybe in the beginning it looks like, oh, not so much. No big deal. What would happen in 100 years if five college students from India began to pray? How about Singapore? Where are the saints from Singapore? How about five college students? What would happen? You think about it. What would the Lord do if five college students from Singapore touched the Lord's heart, saw that God loves man, and they prayed, Lord, cause men to enter the gates? Consider. How about Vietnam? How about five students from Vietnam? What would happen? Consider. How about 10 students from the Philippines? What would happen if 10 students from the Philippines began to pray? Consider. How about 15 students from Thailand? Where are the brothers from Thailand? Aha! Hallelujah! What would happen? Think about it. Consider, what would the Lord do? How about 50 students from Indonesia? Amen, brothers? What would the Lord do with 50 students from Indonesia who would pray, who would touch the Lord's heart? How about Hong Kong? Amen. Brothers, how about 50 students from Hong Kong? Amen. Who would see the Lord's heart for man and would pray? How about 50 students from Korea? Amen. What would the Lord do? If there were 50 students from Korea who would say, Lord, on my campus in Ansan, Cause men to enter the gates. Amen. On my campus in Seoul, cause men to enter the gates. Amen. And Lord, don't forget Pyongyang. Amen. Cause men to enter the gates. Amen. Brothers, consider. Do you think it's too much for God? Do you think it's too much for God? You know, kings' hearts, the hearts of kings are like water in the hands of Jehovah. 
he turns them wherever he wishes. If we would pray, if we would see God's heart for man, brothers, there's no telling what the Lord would do. There's no telling. We have to keep going. I have good news for you. The gates don't only face outward. The gates also continue inward. There are more gates inside God's building. Let's read Roman numeral 8 together. Ready? Go. Underline, we enter into the inner court. We repeat our experience of Christ. Underline that. And then underline, but we experience more of Him. We experience more of Him. The Apostle Paul, he wrote the verses listed here in Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to listen to what he says in Philippians 3, 8. But moreover, I also count all things to be loss on account of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, on account of whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse that I may gain Christ. Say gain Christ. Gain Christ. When the Apostle Paul wrote this verse, it was 26 years after he had met the Lord. Think about it. When he met the Lord, he asked the Lord two questions. Who are you, Lord? And what shall this man do? Who are you, Lord? And what shall I do? And 26 years after, his attitude is, forget it all. I want to gain Christ. I want to gain Christ. You know, it's interesting the more that we repeat our experience of Christ, the better it becomes. And that is the exact opposite of what we experience in the world. Think about it. Oh, I've already played that game before. So boring. I don't want that. I need a new game. Oh, I've already traveled there before. So boring. I gotta go somewhere new. Uh, I've seen that before. So boring. But not so with Christ. We read the Bible again and again and again and again and again. And again, Amen. and again, Amen. and again, Amen. and it's better and better every time. Amen. We go to the Lord's table again, Amen. and again, Amen. and again, Amen. and again, Amen. and we enjoy the cup of blessing. Amen. It's better every time. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there are gates Amen. going inside God's temple. And he wants us to enter in. The higher up we go, the further in we go, the better our experience is. This is our enjoyment of Christ. Okay. God loves man. Say that. God loves man. I want you to be impressed with the gates. God loves man, 
who has not yet entered, and God loves you who have already entered. Wow. we got to move on. We have to continue. Okay, let's read point Roman numeral 9 on the next page. Let's read Roman numeral 9. Ready? Go. This Roman numeral, I'm going to leave to you for your study. It's excellent. It's excellent. In point A, the cross, Christ, and the church are the central subject, not only of the New Testament, but also of the entire Bible. That the altar stands in front of the temple indicates that we cannot have the church apart from the cross. We can have the reality of the church only after we have passed through the cross. This entire Roman numeral opens up the cross, Christ, and the church as seen in Ezekiel's temple. As seen in God's temple in the book of Ezekiel. We have to keep going. Let's go to Roman numeral 10 on page 28. And let's read this Roman numeral together. Ready? Go. And I'll read, Roman num- I'll read point A to you. The chambers on the pavement in the outer court are for the people to eat the offerings. Whereas the holy chambers are for the priests to eat the offerings and also to place and store the offerings and to lay their priestly garments. So, brothers and sisters, the holy chambers connect the outer court and the inner court and it's where the priests eat the offerings, it's where they store the offerings, and it's where they lay their holy garments. I love the holy chambers. It's a place for a holy people eating the holy things, doing a holy service, and wearing holy garments. You know, oftentimes in the day-to-day of my life, I forget who I really am. I just get busy and I'm focusing on accomplishing certain tasks that must get done. Pick this up, wash the dishes, take care of my wife, hold my little baby, all kind of things, lots of things. And I forget who I really am. And then I come to ICT, International College Training. And I remember. I remember that I'm a holy priest. I'm a holy priest dwelling in the holy chambers. I'm eating the most holy things. I'm eating the holy offerings. I'm wearing the holy garments. It's so good to be in this gathering. When we come, when we come to the Lord every day, and when we come to the meetings of the church every week, and when we come to gatherings like this every year, we're reminded who we are. Let's read point B together. Ready? Go. Brothers and sisters, where are you living? In Christ. We're living in Christ. I told some of the brothers earlier that I'm from Austin, Texas, but that's not true. I live in Christ. (laughs) I live in Christ. I'm a holy priest. 
living in the holy chambers. Amen. I live in Christ. Amen. And what do we eat? We eat Christ. Amen. This is what we consume. We are what we eat. Amen. And our diet is Jesus. Amen. We're holy priests Amen. in the holy chambers, Amen. eating the holy offerings. Amen. We're eating Christ. Amen. Do you, are you starting to remember? Doesn't it help to be in gatherings like this? Amen. And what's, what are we wearing? What's our expression? It's Christ. It's Christ. Christ is our expression. Brothers and sisters, you are holy people. Living in a most holy place. You are eating the holy things. And you're expressing the holy God. This is who you are. We're holy priests. In the holy chambers. I hope you take the holy chambers with you in your pocket. The gates and the holy chambers. God loves man. And God loves you. And you are a priest. We have different statuses in life. Sometimes, for a period of time in our life, we are students. For another period of time in our life, we may be employees. The sisters, someday, they will become mothers. And the brothers, someday, will become fathers. We all have different statuses in life. But our identity is priests. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are priests. Amen. We're in the holy chambers. Amen. We're holy people in the holy place, eating the holy things and expressing the holy God. Amen. Aren't you so happy? Amen. Lunch is coming very soon. <laughs> but you have to remember that you are a priest. Amen. Even when you're in the cafeteria, you have to remember, really, I'm in the holy chambers. I'm eating Christ. Amen. Let's read the last point together. Ready? Go. Just before we end, I want us to do one thing. I want you to turn to your neighbor and you're going to pray that the Lord would cause men to enter the gates on your campus, in your city. Do you believe the Lord can do it? Amen. Amen. Okay, turn to your neighbor, pray. Pray.